I'm Holly, I'm the Reluctant Reader, I'm a literature blogger, focused on encouraging more adults to read and holding myself accountable in that process, um, and engaging with authors on their work, especially around interesting and important topics. So we've also got Sophie from Yes She Can. Yes She Can aim to inspire, empower and embolden women in their careers. And today, like I said, we're really excited and fortunate to be speaking with you, Nimco Ali. Um, Nimco, you're the author of this amazing book, which actually I've started reading, so I'm a bit behind on today. Oh, look, lots of different covers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take the back. <laughs> the competition, there we go. Um, yeah. So obviously author of what we're told not to talk about, what we're going to anyway, um, social activist, CEO and founder of the Five Foundation, um, which is a global partnership to end female genital mutilation. You were ordered your OBE in 2019, and you're an independent advisor for tackling violence against women and girls appointed this October with the government. So impressive resume. Can you tell us more detail about your work, please? Um, yeah, so it's, it always sounds interesting when it's like when, when it comes up as professional, because when I first started my activism, I like, you know, I went to law school, I wanted to be a lawyer and then decided maybe not. So I went into policy and stuff. So but yes, yeah, so I started my activism in 2010 um, around the birth of my niece and she was the first girl to be born into my family for um, for decades. And I really just I. At the back of my mind, I knew she probably wouldn't have FGM, but then I thought, I don't know if, like, you know, if the conversation has really changed enough for her to be really safe from FGM. And I threw myself into kind of just trying to get legislation change around that and really just getting more, more of us to talk about FGM as being a human right violation and a form of violence against women and girls, which I thought would be very easy, but it was actually, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done because I opened up myself to really being othered again and really my experience of um, violence or something being something so horrific being um, dismissed so um, since then we've been incredibly successful I first I set up in 2010 as well this organization called Daughters of Eve which is essentially around trying to tackle issues of FGM here in the UK and then set up the Five Foundation last year to really um, support women who are most at risk and those are the ones in Africa. Amazing amazing and uh, We'll, I was going to ask you this at the end, but we'll ask it now because it, it, it flows perfectly because we're talking about FGM. What what can we do? What can we do as a society to help eradicate it, whether that be in the UK or in Africa where it, it's mainly carried out? Yeah. So I think one thing that I hope that people will take away from 2020 is that we're more interlinked than ever. So the forms of violence that happen to girls across the world um, somewhere else is not happening somewhere else. It's actually eroding our also or, or, or maybe um, making our own um, rights and liberties um, less like, you know, less secure. So while FGM is perpetrated anywhere across the world, then women can never be equal. I think equality has to be something that's universal. So what we can do is fundamentally talk about FGM as a form of violence against women and girls and really we change the narrative of stop looking at it as a cultural issue and see this as an organized crime against the gender. I think for me it really like you know I hear offensive things every single day and I don't like take offense because I just think okay fine whatever but I think one of the things that really hurts me and I think and it's and it's literally a painful dagger is when people say to me why should we care about FGM and I'm thinking it's a human right violation it's like the humanity of black little girls matter. And I want people to take away from that is the fact that it doesn't matter what, what race these girls are to be held down and have your anatomy cut so you can just be sold at a higher price is like, it's just barbaric. And that kind of sets the foundation for human trafficking. It sets the foundation for domestic violence. It sets the foundation where we are now in the 21st century, where we have the leader of one of the largest religions in the world saying, oh, access to abortion is like, you know, is a crime. I don't think those, those, those are things that blow my mind. FGM is as realistic as women in Poland losing the right to have access to contraception and safe and legal abortions because we've just been silent and we just think, well, as long as I'm finding my own little silo, then everything else is okay. No, I think our, our civil liberties and our human rights are interlinked. Absolutely. Um, just to add to that, kind of so to contextualise for people who maybe don't know about FGM, yeah. know a lot, can you explain in a way that people understand contextually how widespread it is both in the UK and globally and what's being done to address it? Yeah, um, globally, there are 200 million women um, living with the consequence of FGM. That's more, pe women, that's more people than are in human slavery. 
um, there's more people that are than us um, are um, suffering from or have been infected with HIV and AIDS. So it's a massive global pandemic, and and the, and and, the, and there's a real in, in, in intersectionality between those forms of violence. Many of the women in sub-Saharan Africa who have been subjected to FGM are also living with the, um, are living with HIV and AIDS and not getting the treatment that they need. So. Um, in the UK, there's 137,000 women um, living with FGM, and many of those are women like me who are in their 30s. There has been like um, UN resolutions passed, and many countries, including the United Kingdom, have legislation against FGM. But, but, but what we haven't done fundamentally is really start to invest at a local level in Africa, specifically. The UK has been great. It's um, it added FGM to the Children's Act. We have medical in interventions now for survivors like myself um, the home office communities education everybody's really really involved I think we need um, clearer pathways in order to protect women and support girls but globally what we need is funding for, for women in Africa because between now and 2030 there are 70 million girls at risk of FGM that's more than the whole population of the United Kingdom could be subjected to FGM in the next um, um, eight to nine years. And many of those women that are subjected to FGM are going to be born to young adolescent girls who were sold after they were subjected to FGM. And it doesn't happen because people think that this is an amazing thing to do or as part of their culture. It happens because FGM is an economic investment into girls and girls are the biggest commodity that Africa has or the way that it's structured, it's the biggest commodity. So you pay for FGM so you can sell your daughter for more. So if you need cattle, you sell a girl. With FGM, you get more cattle. If you need land, you sell a girl. And, you, and with FGM, you get more. So on a community level, it's actually investment in a property. And women are seen as local property as opposed to active citizens um, in, in those um, countries, which then leads to more um, forms of violence to, um, against women. So okay. did, you, did you want to ask anything else on that point or do you want to wait until the end? Uh, I'll wait until the end if that's all right, Hal. Yeah, that's cool. Um, should we talk about the book? If that is <laughs> there. Um, obviously, you know, you know, we have both described you as an activist first and foremost and an author at secondary. Having said that, obviously the book doesn't necessarily mean it's of secondary importance, but how did you get into writing? Um, so I've always like written, I think talking and writing are very two key things in terms of communicating. And I, honestly, I think the first bits of writing that I ever did were um, were in, in my journal. And because it, for me, it was really interesting because growing up, I never really talked about my FGM. So I always talked about it in a third person. And the talk in a third person is always better to write that down because you sound, am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah, yeah. Do what you like. <laughs> Because I think you sound like a bit of a wanker if you start talking about something in the third person. So um, writing allowed me to kind of communicate things that I felt um, needed to be said. And also it's a bit easier when there's no name linked to um, a statement, then you can basically see, see, see the statement more than you see the person. So when I would say FGM is violence against women and girls about myself, look at like, you know, looking at um, 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 how I do, obviously my race and gender comes into it, but then when somebody else says it, it's completely different. So that was my way of actually passing information to people that needed to um, have that information. So where did the idea of the book come from? What inspired you to tell these women's stories and, and how's the book, what impact has it had since it's been published? Yeah, so the kind of the idea of the book came, I always had this idea because I read the vagina monologues and I really um, enjoyed that. But I also saw, saw it was a white woman's co-opting experiences of other women. So whether it was the horrific um, rapes in Bosnia, it was always being told by the, through the lens of this white woman. And it's like, we, we always talk about Eve Entler and never talk about the women in those books and uh, you know, in, in the stories and the story that she was telling. And I always wanted to just tell, I, I talk a lot to people. I don't, I think that's my greatest, um, my, my ex-boyfriend used to say, well, one of your greatest skills is you have good chat. <laughs> so I don't like, I don't differentiate between the prince and the pauper. I can just have conversations with, with people. I just start having these like really um, random conversations. And I would go across the world when I first started my activism and talk to women about their experiences. And I just used to say, we all like we've all had a period but hopefully we'll all have an orgasm like, like you know pregnancies and menopause like there are two optional things in those four things that happen to women so 
And for me, it was something that I just wanted to talk about because my anatomy was something that I was meant to be ashamed of. And I never felt shame. I just would just talk about it. So when um, one of the... Um, one of the agents at Penguin came to me and said, we want you to write a book about um, about yourself. I said, but there's very little to say about me. It's like, as, 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 as interesting I might sound on the outside, it's like, it's not like I'm not there yet to be telling my life story. So, but I would love to do a collection of um, women's book um, st stories about, I can go into the toilet the first time um, after after um, um, after you, you've had a baby. What is it like the first time you had an orgasm? But I wanted it to be really funny, and I wanted it to be called rude because it was like very like we shouldn't be saying these things. But then it just it just got deeper and deeper, and I started to find a lot about myself in that and in having those conversations. And I and, I, and then I found a lot about women across the world going through this experience between the relationship between a mother and a daughter is fought with so many um, emotions where you wish for the best for your daughter but then you're also scared and sometimes if your daughter does do better than you you are kind of jealous or like you know resentful in a weird kind of way and those are things that we're never able to talk about so so that's how we just kind of materialize into something which is a little bit more powerful and a little bit more deeper especially when I started talking about my own experiences um so yeah so that's um that's how the book came about but in terms of the impact I didn't necessarily do as much pushing um as I would have because again I was kind of like I put my words and then I was thinking my god if people read it then they're gonna really see an intimate side um to me and self-promotion is not one of my main things I'm always speaking on behalf of others to kind of ch help change the world um, so yeah, but it's been like the incredible feedback I've got from young women, from men. And weirdly enough, yesterday um, I met a former um, Secretary of State for the UK who was trying to get me to do something. And then he said, "I bought your book." And I was thinking, "Do you know what you're letting yourself in for?" <laughs> so this this old white man, who's a conservative old white man who's in his sixties, he's going to be reading my book after he has knee surgery. So that'll be really interesting to see that book in the middle of a hospital. It's um, it'll be hilarious. So. I'm hopefully looking forward to what his feedback on that is. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That would be yeah. interesting. I think more and more people need to read it, especially guys. Yeah. I think that's where, like you say, I think a lot of decision makers are still old white guys. So the more people who are exposed to that and they're reading other people's experiences that are not like themselves, but maybe somebody that they know further down the line, then the, hopefully that will bring about the change that that's needed. Um, yeah, definitely. I agree with that. So you mentioned uh, the themes of the book. So there's periods, orgasms, pregnancy and the menopause um, yeah. for very, very um, intimate and personal themes for, for every for everyone. How did you work with these women to get them to open up? I appreciate they're all anonymized, but how, how did you say, look, come on, trust me, share this. This is going to have such a positive impact, which it has had certainly on Holly and I who've read it and, and you know, the feedback you've got. Yeah, some of those women, I've, like, so these conversations had kind of stayed with me. So they're conversations that I've all, like, you know, that I knew. So I went back to them, to those women. I said, can we talk about it again? And others is like, when I, when I put the treatment together for, for the book, I sent it to them because there were women out there who I knew, but um, I, I basically, um, like, you know, I've all, like, you know, I thought about straight away because I'd, I'd met them through my activism, met them through like friendships or whatever it is. And I just wanted to go to them and actually have a conversation. And for me, as somebody that's, an, that's a professional oversharer, people used to come to me and tell me their stories because I would talk about um, um, some stuff. But then I really realized there, there were some women who, um, who I really wanted to interview, but then I thought to myself, actually, do you know what, Nimco, you know what voyeurism is like, and I don't, I don't think it's okay to ask that question. So there's an incredible woman who campaigned against um, um, rape, um, the rape legislation in, in Pakistan. And I met her when I was in Karachi and she'd been gang raped and then she had to go kill herself um um after that 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 was the kind of that was basically the sentence and the and the, uh, and the concept of justice was the fact that she should be ashamed and um commit suicide and she so when i met her in karachi there was this like this level of sadness that i hadn't seen ever in the back of her eyes and i just thought i really wanted to talk to her about her experience of um sex after rape and i and i'd love to know like you know 
what you think that you like are you gonna ever get married are you kind of like you know what has that taken away from you because I think you can survive trauma and you can live beyond violence um but you have to be given those opportunities and I and I had seen her take on um catwalk shows in America so she I think she did New York Fashion Week I think she's been but nobody had ever sat down and actually allowed her to give her the space to heal and we were on this platform together and I just like literally we just held hands. I just thought I just felt I just felt really um like you know, I could feel that level of sadness where everybody was thinking was um bravery. So there were women like that who I wish I could interview and share their stories, but I just thought it is not my place to say that because even within this kind of like the the fact that she is taking on the issue of shame in like you know in in Pakistan and so on, I also know I I I don't know what Pandora's box I would I would I would open in those kind of conversations and what support I would give. So these were women who I'd always looked up to and had kind of said something. So like for example, Jacob's mother, which I call Jacob's mother because it was about him, had had like I was at a um so she's very famous and very senior and she was at a um event and she said, um, my four children. The mother of I'm I'm like, you know, being the mother of four, and I knew at that time that her son had passed away. And I just thought that was a really powerful thing. So when I said I was going to write this book and I said, can I have this conversation with you? And she was so open about that. So it was women that I'd kind of admired um, through the years and I'd always wanted to tell their stories because I think I think it's, I think we all through that part of our body have so many shared experiences, but we just think because of our race or um, of our faith or our, of our geographical locations, then we can't have anything in common. Yeah, yeah, and I have to say I learned a lot from the book because there were, you know, numerous women, you know, from the Middle East or, you know, there's a couple of references to Dubai, Abu Dhabi. I learned a huge amount um, because, you know, I'm I'm a white woman from the East Midlands, so yeah, yeah. It, it certainly was learning for me as well. And I think it's really interesting. It's like like the human the human trafficking aspects of women and the way that we look at the commodified case, like how 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 sex and that part of the body is like you know seen as a commodity i find that like incredibly fascinating and how people don't see that as actually violence it's like if you are like if any part of the female body is looked at something to make money out of then i then then that becomes problematic i think it's like there could be very like you know academic conversations about sex work and prostitution but i think when we start to commodify, like look at women as a commodity, even in the way that we're sold things or whatever. I just think that's, I think that's massively problematic, and that, and then that part of the body being seen as like something that people are entitled to, not something that belongs to us. I, again, as somebody who's a survivor, um, from a country where, um, and a culture where that there's so much shame around that in order to protect you from really owning, having ownership over it. I just, I, you know, I just like I always say, um. Like when when people call men um, cunts, I say they're deep and warm places, full of knowledge, and give birth to life. So let's just chill. I don't think men can have that level. So yeah, I just honestly, I'm just fascinated by the myriads of stories that come through our anatomy. Um, Holes, um, I just wanted to ask. Um, so obviously we've talked about kind of like what's going on in trying to help resolve FGM and stuff, but how can the everyday person get involved and support the cause? Yeah. So two ways. One is like, please join us at the five foundation. We really need your help and any donation would be like, you know, incredible at this time right now. And um, two, it's like, honestly, we need to decolonize the way that we give aid. It's like, so um, about a week ago, um, the, the, the government decided that the 0.7%, which is 14 billion that, that we give every year, is going to be reduced. There was a lot of people that were shouting, saying, oh, this is going to imp imp impact the most vulnerable people in the world. I'm like, no, it's not. It's actually going to impact these massive INGOs that have massive budgets. Two of them have actually been struck off because they've been using women um, as prostitutes um, when they should be supporting them and like letting children die. So what we need to do is actually put, give, 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 um, give our governments and massive foundations the ability to be confident enough to trust black women as the agents of change. And it's like, for me, as somebody that's been in this sector for nine years, has a proven record, has all these other kind of things, the level of like racism I get for like, and, and, and the questioning of the work that I do and like, you know, the impact of it is just like completely ridiculous. And I will say to you, 
every single report that is based on ending FGM that a massive INGO um, gives you is based on the work and the lived experience of women on the front line who happen to be African women whose words are being used and commoditized in a different kind of way. So I would love for us to, like, you know, for you, especially young people um, that are not necessarily in this sector to really get educated about how we give money, how we give aid. And like, like you know, this country, um, took me and my family in as refugees. This country gives a lot of money in, in terms of international development aid, but we want that money to get to the people that need it. So then we can actually be able to say, I, look, this is what we did through solidarity and through allyship is that we stood with the most po with the poorest women in the world and actually helped them. And we're, and we're not doing that at the moment. Is there anything else that you want to add? I just want to say that, like, you know, ending FGM is a tangible reality in our lifetime. And I always just, and I also just really, really want us to, like, you know, to start talking about our lived experiences and our, um, and, and like, you know, the, the things that we're told to be um, embarrassed about and shame, like, you know, to feel shame on. I'm also starting a new health board, which um, ultimately is about actually ensuring that the NHS and other people um, protect women, women's health and women, women's health is seen as a priority. And then on a fundamental thing is like, I really like, if I could, my greatest wish for this country would be to decriminalize abortion. And I really, I, you know, want us to be conscious about the fact that, that, that they're coming for our rights. And if I, you know, if your readers and your um, support, support, um, supporters can also go out there and actually support our sisters in Poland and our sisters in South America who are losing their fundamental rights to access to healthcare. I think it's, it really scares me as somebody that comes from a community where I am told I don't have any rights over my body. And then to be in a country where I've been given the rights because so many women have fought for them to see those being stripped away by so-called civilized countries, it's actually quite horrific. So I like, you know, want to say love and solidarity to my sisters in Poland. And like, you know, we need to, we need to unite together to make sure that these creeping um, limitations on our human rights don't come to our doorstep as well. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Thank you so much for your time. Um, yeah. On behalf of Yes She Can and The Reluctant Reader, thanks so, so much. Uh, Nim Kwali, activist and author. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good week.